Hi, everybody. The topic that a lot of people have been recently asking me to speak on for these videos is actually around the tragic death around of Matthew Perry. And I, I am like with you, uh, like with the world in terms of really processing a lot of feelings around this, being a Generation X, being uh, that generation that really kind of grew up with that show and feeling so many different feelings and, and having thoughts around this, partly because, you know, obviously I'm a relationship leadership expert, but I'm also a health professional. And so I'm looking at it from the, the lens as a mental health professional and really trying to kind of connect the dots in terms of what actually happened. So I'm gonna be sharing with you uh, some of my thoughts on this uh, in this video. So just just today, Hollywood Reporter said the title of the article is this, like when a beetle dies, Hollywood unpacks why Matthew Perry's loss feels so massive. Insiders who helped shaped friends and who were shaped by it talk about why multiple generations were so enormously attached to the star and have been so been hit so hard by his death. So I'm going to be really sharing with you my insights um, my thoughts on what I think really happened um, from a mental health uh, perspective and also there I think some really big takeaways actually on this as well. He was never, I want to be full disclosure, he was never one of my clients, although I wish he was one of my clients. I wish I could have sat him down in my office and I could have really shared with him what my my own two cents are in terms of with the choices that he was making and his some of the root issues and how that affected his decision making and how you know things that he could have done to I think who have to have helped himself so that he wasn't part of this um this obviously this awful tragedy and so so when I listen to uh when I watch him in interviews and I read parts of his book and I listen to um, a lot of his friends, colleagues, uh, and what they say about him. In my opinion, what I see is somebody who has struggled enormously with a lack of self-worth. And if you've seen my TED Talk, and you've seen me talk about the three chairs, and you've seen me talk about these three different mindsets, and again, I don't know, I, don't, I didn't know him, this is just on my observation with what I'm actually seeing, but my observation would be somebody who really sits in that left chair, uh, somebody who really, although physically attractive, incredibly gifted, uh, famous, wealthy, has all the check marks, right? Like all these things that you would think, of course, the person's going to be happy. And it, it really kind of speaks to the root issue around self-worth. Self-worth is not based on externals. Self-worth is based on our mindset and the attitude that we have of ourself. And if we don't have a healthy mindset, that will, can plague us with enormous amount of anxiety and depression, and that can massively impact in terms of our overall decision-making. So what I think was the root issue, okay, the root issue is I think he struggled enormously with self-worth. And struggled in that in that left chair. Uh, for those of you who have seen my TED talk, and things that I that I've heard and seen and read that give me that indication. So here are some of the signs, okay, of it. And this is again, if you see my TED talk, if you've read my book, The Three Chairs, um, th this is all kind of hopefully going to kind of make sense. But one of the things that we find with people who have uh, really deep insecurity, part of the mindset is, um, you know. If I get X, I will be happy. So, you know, things that I've read, for example, is that, you know, he, he had this really, really, really big need, need to be, be, to be famous, um, really big need to be famous. And there's nothing wrong with being famous. I've got, I've actually got lots of famous clients. So being, having a desire to be famous, is not necessarily good or bad, but it's the word need. There's a big difference between needing and wanting. And so for somebody who struggles with self-worth, a lot of times the mindset is I'm okay if, or I am worthy if, fill in the blank. I'm famous, I have this amount of money, I've, get, I've got this partner, if, if, if. And it's a lie because these external things don't make people happy. We see this, he's a great, he's a great example of that. He had a lot of these external successes, but that did not uh, fix 
um, or, or really change his mindset. Okay. And so, so that's one big sign. Okay. Is when people have such a need, uh, to kind of get external success that somehow that's going to kind of feed, uh, or fix their self-worth. That's kind of like one big variable. The other piece that was really interesting when I kind of read and listen to part of his story is his, um, the way that he approached relationships. So, um, he, he mentioned, and I saw this in several different places that in a lot of his, and I believe actually all of his significant relationships, he would break off, he would break up with a person before they broke up with him. That is actually also a sign of somebody who kind of a lot of times sits in that left chair. Um, it's the sense of I'm not worthy for this relationship. So I'm going to kind of break this thing off so that they can't actually hurt me. And it's a little bit in, in terms of when we see people struggle with self-esteem and with goal setting, it's like, I'm not even, I'm going to, I'm going to basically, I'm going to quit before I even actually try. I'm not actually not even going to try so that I can at least tell myself that I didn't really actually try. And what happens is it becomes a total self-sabotage. All of a sudden somebody actually, it becomes a, like a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's like the very thing that they're so afraid of is the very thing that actually actually happens. And so, um, and so that, that's another really, really big, um, a big sign that I actually wonder if he actually struggled, um, a lot with, uh, with security. And so that, so that's, that's huge. Okay. That's really huge because what happens is when somebody doesn't feel worthy, all of a sudden they're now, and they're either going to break off with relationships before, you know, before somebody can actually hurt them with, with, with what he did, but then they put themselves in a really vulnerable place where they just really stop kind of caring about their life. People can kind of go into their, they're more vulnerable in terms of actually experienced in depression. And the scary part about with depression is that all of a sudden people can really, um, start making some really poor decisions. And we see this over and over again with a lot of people with any kind of addiction and addiction is, is so powerful when it gets its claws in you and it just pulls you further in and in and in, um, you know, obviously we can have emotional addictions. We can have physical addictions. There could be sexual addictions. There's, there's lots of different types of addictions, but consistently with research, we find that people who have struggled with self-esteem and self-worth, they're more vulnerable to, uh, to addiction. And it's not like one causes the other. Uh, we never say that, you know, low self-esteem causes addiction. We can say based on research that when somebody has a lower self-worth, they're, they're more at risk. They're more at risk uh, because what happens with the, the attraction with so many addictions is when somebody is not feeling good about themselves, they want to have distractions. They want to have other things just to kind of distract them. And that's the, for some people, that's why going to whether it's drugs or alcohol or other kinds of addiction, it kind of gives them a quote unquote escape from the pain that they're experiencing. But unfortunately, um, that addiction, which helps them in a moment to distract them, literally starts taking over their life. And so it literally, when I read his story, the more I read about it and the more I understand here really from his own words, and I love watching interviews with, you know, things that he had said, I just saw somebody who is so deeply in pain and somebody who did not understand his self-worth and then started making decisions that really destroyed him. And I think that, in my opinion, that was kind of, you know, with what was kind of happening for, you know, started sounding even like it started, started the issue, you know, as a teenager, and then it got progressively worse, uh, worse in his twenties, even as the success, external success was coming. And it really took hold of him in his thirties and his forties. And so that's what I think was like the real deep, deep issue. The positive part of the story is that despite being somebody who is an enormous amount of pain, he continually showed this enormous resilience muscle trying to get help. And while I was in pain, starting to put up his hand, reaching out to his mom and stepfather 
to I'm really struggling here and I need to get myself in rehab and not going to rehab once, but going to rehab many, many, many times and really falling and picking himself back up, falling, picking himself back up again. This enormous amount of resilience that he showed is really remarkable, actually. And through his rehab, through a lot of therapy, coming to a place, it sounded like this last part of his, this last chapter of his life, it sounds like he really started make, turning a corner and start understanding his sense of self um, and his sense of self-worth, which is really beautiful. Um, and also understanding his purpose. On my Instagram, I posted a quote. I'm just going to read it uh, really quick. And his six, his favorite six words in his own words, my favorite six works, my favorite six words in recovery are trust God, clean house, help others. And to me, that is, that is the finale of his, of his life story, that enormous amount of pain didn't know how to do it, realized that he could not do it alone, started putting his hand up, asking for help, and was able to really turn his pain into his purpose. Trust God, clean house, help others. Trust God, realize he cannot do this alone. Clean house, like take responsibility and do the work. Help others, really making make this pain that he's experienced and turn it into his purpose. And so, I am so uh, happy to see that that's where that's where he landed. And although, you know, it's a, still a tragedy, the fact in terms of how young he died, um, and it's almost like emotionally, it feel it seems like he got healthier near the end, but it feels it seems like physically his body had just been like. I just can't do this anymore. And that's, that's the consequences, right? Those are the consequences of choices. And so, uh, this, this last week, as I've been talking with clients and colleagues and teams, my own family, my own kids, my encouragement to all of us, if we, if there's one thing we really work on is really focus on our developing a solid sense of self, a solid sense of self, a solid sense of self-worth, work on the mindset, work really heavily on how the messages that we tell ourselves, so that we can feel confident, we can feel confident and secure because when we have that, it has a massive ripple effect in terms of the decisions that we all make. So that's my hope uh, and prayer for all of us. And I hope he is resting in peace and I'm grateful to him for sharing his words of encouragement to really for all of us, whether or not we know somebody who struggles with addiction, somebody who um, is a family member of somebody who's struggling with addiction, realizing that help is available, but we do need to lean in. Favorite six words, trust God, clean house, and help others.